I don't know, a big one today. Nice day. Ranker. Team's up. Ready. At a quarterback. For the Nittany Lions, the 1980 season was one of the most challenging in 94 years of Penn State football. After an 8-4 record in 1979, the Nittany Lions entered the new decade facing one of the toughest schedules in the country. Fourteen starters were back from the team that beat Tulane in the 1979 Liberty Bowl. Ten from the starting defensive unit. The offense was led by a veteran front line, but as September rolled around, some key skill positions were question marks. It would be up to the seniors to lead this 1980 Penn State football team to whatever heights it might attain. It would be a season to meet the challenge. The 1980 season opener at expanded Beaver Stadium marked Penn State University's 125th anniversary. For the second consecutive year, opening day belonged to a young running back from Wyoming, West Virginia. Against Colgate, sophomore Kurt Warner, number 25, posted a career high 149 yards rushing and scored the game's first three touchdowns to pace the Lions. Senior tailback, turned fullback, Booker Moore, picked up 58 yards. And freshman Kevin Bow added 93 and a touchdown, as the Lions offense amassed an impressive 562 yards in the 54-10 victory over the Raiders. With victory number one under their belts, the untested Lions ventured into Southwest Conference territory to College Station, Texas, remembering last year's loss at the hands of the Aggies. On the first possession, the Lions put together an 80-yard scoring drive capped by Booker Moore's two-yard plunge. Defensive ends Gene Gladys and number 88 Larry Kubin accounted for 19 tackles to lead a defense which held the Aggies to only one touchdown and a field goal while the blue and white offense rolled up almost 400 yards. It was an important 25 to 9 victory on the road. record 84,585 fans packed Beaver Stadium on a sunny September afternoon as a 2-0 Nittany Lions hosted undefeated Nebraska in a nationally televised game. Certainly the toughest challenge yet for Coach Paterno's young team. A determined effort and some success against a veteran Nebraska defense was made more difficult because of turnovers. A fumbled snap and an intercepted pass each set up Nebraska scores. Midway through the second quarter, the Lions closed the gap. Freshman quarterback Todd Blackledge lofted a picture-perfect pass down the sideline to Kenny Jackson. Two plays later, Kurt Warner put the Lions on the scoreboard. In the second half, the Cornhuskers' only sustained drive of the game was enough to make the difference. The Penn State defensive unit, led by veterans Pete Kugler, Greg Jones, and Frank Case, had its day in the sun holding the Cornhuskers to one touchdown in the final 30 minutes of play. Though we lost to Nebraska 21-7, in the second half against Nebraska, we shut them down. 
we had a defensive meeting the next day and our defensive coach told us that he thought by the end of the year we would be a defense that had a lot of pride in ourselves and that we were just starting to come together as a defense. So I feel that you know Nebraska was the turning point for the defense to go forward. The following week at Missouri, another Big 8 team, another big challenge. Missouri was a good team and we weren't really sure how good we were. It was a really tough situation for us to go in there and uh, play on the road against a good team and uh, try and find out what kind of character our team had. After three and a half minutes of play, ninth-ranked Missouri had taken a 7-0 lead. Penn State came right back with third and three on the Missouri 24. Freshman Todd Blackledge, making his first start, dropped into the pocket, his eye on senior tight end Brad Scoville. We ran a, uh, a hook pattern where all the receivers hook, and they were playing man to man. And uh, the man who was covering me thought I was going deep, and I just turned in underneath him, caught the ball and turned back upfield, got a good block from uh, Greg Garrity, and uh, scored pretty easily. But the Tigers scored just as easily, and five minutes later had gone out in front. Down 21-16 in the third quarter, the Lions roared back. Paul Lankford intercepted Phil Bradley and returned to the Tiger 33. Missouri held, and Penn State settled for a field goal. Three plays later, Langford picked off another Bradley aerial, and again, Herb Benhart got the call. His kick was true from 34 yards out, giving Penn State a 22-21 third quarter lead. featured two big Penn State plays. Confronted with third and 10 on his own 14, quarterback Blackledge found Kenny Jackson down the right side for the important first down. Six plays later, Blackledge cut behind a John Waterwitz block, went the distance, and the Lions had a courageous second half come from behind victory. held the explosive Missouri Tigers scoreless in the final 37 minutes of the game. When it counted, the offense had rallied to make the big play. The Lions had bounced back on the road against top flight competition. Their victory over Missouri was the turning point of the season. For the third time in four weeks, Penn State was on the road, this time to meet the Maryland Terrapins. Once again, the Lions had to come from behind. By the second half, the offensive line had adjusted to the Terrapins' wide tackle six, and Booker Moore burst up the middle to tie the score at 10. In the second half alone, Penn State rolled up 296 yards, and freshman flanker Kenny Jackson posted his first collegiate score. Early in the fourth quarter, junior linebacker Chet Parlevecchio stepped in front of the intended Maryland receiver, intercepted, and rambled 37 yards down the sidelines. Freshman halfback Jonathan Williams finished the drive with a soft lob to Mike Mead as the Lions won going away 24 to 10. Eastern rival Syracuse struggled through a damp afternoon at Beaver Stadium and became the third straight victim of a Penn State second half surge. Booker Moore broke the game open once again in the second half with the help of outstanding blocking from center Bob Jaggers, All-American Sean Farrell, and senior guard John Wadowitz. Booker 
uh, ran very well. He was cutting back against the grain. And uh, I think the, the offensive line played a good game, controlling the line of scrimmage. And we were starting to gel then. We were starting to be really cohesive as an offensive unit. Booker turned in his third career 100-yard day. Comfortable now at his fullback position and with the superb offensive line. Kurt Warner chewed up the final 40 yards of the drive with seven straight carries. And the Lions went in front 17 to 7. Another strong second half defense held Syracuse scoreless. The happy homecoming day ended with a 24 to 7 Penn State triumph. Following week in rainy West Virginia, Penn State was fighting for its fourth consecutive win late in the game. Four plays after the second half kickoff, a Mountaineer threat was averted when Pete Kugler forced a fumble at the two and Pete Harris recovered. Still, the Mountaineers pulled within two points. With a slim 10-8 margin, it was Kurt Warner time. The West Virginia native returned the Mountaineer kickoff 88 yards for a touchdown, his second of the season and third of his career, a Penn State record. On the next possession, the Lions capped a sustained 71-yard drive with Herb Menhart's second field goal of the day and a 20-8 lead. When the Mountaineers turned a Penn State fumble into seven points and recovered the onside kick, they were back within striking distance. With less than four minutes to go, the challenge of the moment rested squarely on the defense. A five-point lead must be protected. Time was winding down. On third and 12 from the Penn State 38, Oliver Luck threw into the secondary. Pete Harris moved in for the interception juggled the ball before brother Giuseppe stepped in to sure hand it. The Lions 20 to 16 margin was secure. The Lions posted their 22nd consecutive victory over West Virginia. Back to Beaver Stadium to meet another nationally ranked team. Miami Hurricanes blew into town, featuring a vaunted defense and a pass-oriented offense. Booker Moore ground assault, which had already rolled up over 1,100 yards through the first half of the season, shredded the defense. Todd Blackledge commanded the aerial assault, and directed the Lions to their fifth consecutive win. in a play reminiscent of the 79 Liberty Bowl pass, which set up the winning field goal against Tulane, Joel Coles connected with Kenny Jackson for six. The defense held the Miami running game to just 69 yards. counted, it shut down Jim Kelly's passing attack, which had been so productive the year before. The 
Bulls' 27-12 win was impressive, coming over another 1980 bowl-bound opponent. Coming off that fine overall performance, Penn State greeted the North Carolina State Wolfpack with two quick scores. One on a Todd Blackledge, Kenny Jackson connection. The Lions were back in the national top 10 and owned a seven and one record. The veteran defensive unit, including Steve Griffiths and Bob Gladden, allowed only one touchdown and stopped North Carolina State on 12 of 14 third down tries. The offensive unit more than made up for early missed opportunities. Kurt Warner contributed 97 yards on the ground. Junior tailback Joel Coles added 151 yards on only 12 carries, his best ever Penn State performance. The combination of the run and the pass resulted in an impressive 471 total yard performance and a 21 to 13 Lion victory. Offense kept rolling at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia when the Lions took on the Temple Owls. On his first carry from scrimmage, Booker Moore joined the elite club of six Lions who had passed the 2,000 yard career mark. A 38 point second half for Penn State was highlighted by a big day for tight end Mike McCloskey in front of his hometown fans. The running strength of quarterback Frank Rocco. And an electrifying 62 yard punt return by Kevin Bow as the Lions defeated Temple 50 to seven. the game, the Lions accepted an invitation to Fiesta Bowl 10 and returned to State College to prepare for the annual battle of Route 22. The day after Thanksgiving, Penn State and Pitt, two teams in the top five met in Beaver Stadium in a renewal of the oldest rivalry for both schools. was what most fans anticipated. A classic battle between two natural rivals. Penn State scored first from 27 yards out. Pitt scored first in the second half. The touchdown play a Tricano sprint to the corner of the end zone. From that point on, Penn State shut down the Panther offense. A sack by junior Leo Wisniewski. On a third and five from the pit 20, Tricano back to pass. Leaping interception by Gene Gladys gave the Lions possession. Five plays later, Blackledge threaded the needle with a pass to Kenny Jackson. The defense held Pittsburgh to only one first down in the final 17 minutes of the game. The time ran out and Penn State was nine and two. 
regular season ended on that cloudy November afternoon, and a date with Ohio State in Tempe, Arizona, the day after Christmas, offered the Lions a chance to bounce back again to meet yet another challenge. The Nittany Lions arrived at their lavish Fiesta Bowl headquarters before Christmas, soaked up the warm Arizona sun, and tuned their skills in one way or the other. Fiesta Bowl 10, Penn State's 10th consecutive postseason appearance. The Lions and the Buckeyes of Ohio State. The teams had identical records. Senior captains Bob Jaggers and Greg Jones prepared to lead the team one last time. On the Lions' first play from scrimmage, the offensive unit exploded off the line, cleared out the Buckeyes, and sophomore speedster Kurt Warner raced 64 yards for the score. answered on the next series. Doug Donnelly got between the short and deep coverage and floated into the end zone. The Buckeyes collected 13 more before the Lions managed three and the half ended. Ohio State 19, Penn State 10. The second half was another matter. As they had done against so many teams, the Lions came roaring back. On the first play from scrimmage, Kurt Warner swept left end for the first 18 yards of a 75-yard scoring drive, capped by a black ledge keeper to the right side. The Lions had pulled to within two. The defense, now certainly one of the most respected in college football, shut down everything the Buckeyes had to offer. In the third quarter, the Lions gave up only one first down and turned the ball back to the offensive unit as the quarter came to an end. On the second play of the final quarter, the offensive line once again blew open the Ohio State defense and Jonathan Williams had six. Penn State had regained the lead. On Ohio State's next possession, Schleister mounted the Buckeyes' only serious drive of the second half. But on fourth and three at the Penn State 27, Schleister and the Buckeyes were stopped cold. With four minutes to go, the Lions put in motion a precise offensive drive, moving to three important first downs. in his final appearance as a Lion, exploded through the front line on his last Penn State carry. It was a classic Booker Moore, 37-yard cutback run to Pater. There had been questions in September. The youth, the inexperience, uncertainties about what the Lions could do, what kind of team they really had. At season's end, there were positive answers about character, determination, dedication. Booker Moore says it pretty well. And, and this year, in the upper class, you know, I think it was more dedication. You know, we really wanted to prove to everyone that we had a very good football team. That was our main goal. You know, we worked hard at it, and, and it paid off in the end. So if, if there's one thing I remember, it's, it's the dedication of this team. Well, it was a, a very exciting season. It was a coach's season in the sense we had a lot of people who really wanted to be good and they worked every day in practice with tremendous intensity to get good. It was a great combination of young people with some really fine senior leadership. Hopefully it was a, a year that, that we proved to people again that we have a fine program, but we're looking forward to next year. You know, we just have a lot of things going for us. Our schedule really builds up, you know, with Nebraska and Notre Dame and Alabama. And I think the Fiesta Bowl was just a, a good stepping stone for us into the future because we beat another good football team. And, uh, you know, it was a good way to send the seniors off this year and a good way to start the 1981 and the rest of the 80s for Penn State. And 1981 will indeed be a happy new year for all those associated with Penn State football. The players, coaches, alumni, fans everywhere. 
the beginning of more glory years, confirming Happy Valley as the college football capital of the East. You can literally feel excitement, anticipate the drive, determination, and excellence that will be Penn State football for years to come. The future is nothing but bright because the 1980 Nittany Lions had come together. Victory was theirs. They had met the challenge. Penn State University is located in Pennsylvania's heartland, and its 84,000-seat Beaver Stadium, always filled to capacity, makes State College Pennsylvania the football capital of the East. Penn State fans could hardly wait for 1981. The anticipation was the highest ever. The schedule, difficult. Uh, we played an awfully tough schedule, but I think that by the end of the season, uh, we grew in maturity as far as talent and position. I think we just worked well together as a team. The 1981 edition of the Nittany Lions would have to put together a blend of experience, leadership, dedication, and exuberance if Penn State was to make great expectations become giant achievements. Head coach Joe Paterno led the Lions onto the gridiron to begin a 1981 schedule rated the nation's most difficult. By the time the last 1982 resolution was made, Penn State would not only have survived, but would have achieved a 10-2 record and a number three national ranking. Extremely skilled athletes gave the Lions their quickest attack in years. Outstanding offensive line play would make it possible for a junior running back to attain brilliance. The defense, with superb senior leadership, combined intelligence and toughness to out-physical opponents all year. The result? This team was to write 1981 as one of the finest and most rewarding chapters in Penn State football history. It was a Cincinnati game, the first game. You know, we come running out and there's 84,000 there waiting to see how good this Penn State team's gonna be because they heard so much about us. Hearing isn't believing. Seeing is. The junior running back, Kirk Warner, wasted little time showing Lion fans the kind of success he and his teammates were determined to have. 122 yards and three first half touchdowns later, Warner and the Penn State offense had riddled the Cincinnati defense for 52 points, making happy believers of the late summer crowd. Not to be upstaged, the new defense did it all. A brilliant interception by Ken Kelly. quarterback sack by Walker Lee Ashley, a rich D'Amico fumble recovery. By afternoon's end, Penn State had impressively added shutout opener number 44 to the Nittany Lion record books. We thought both the offense and the defense played well against Cincinnati, but I think we had to take a little more pride in our defensive efforts since any time you have a shutout, that's a heck of an accomplishment no matter who you play. But we also knew when we went into Nebraska that we were playing not only the Cornhuskers, but a, a crowd that is almost every time you go there a seven-point favorite in, Neba in Nebraska's favor. So uh, we also knew that we were the different breed of Penn State player that can go in there and handle a Penn uh, Nebraska challenge like that and come out on top, and that's just what we did. We played them hard, we hit them, and we won. The blue and white cheers were engulfed by Nebraska Red, but Penn State excellence took form on the stadium carpet in the person of Kurt Warner. Warner roared and juked and raced for 238 yards, an all-time record for an opponent at Memorial Stadium. Kurt Warner served notice that this Penn State team could explode any time. Senior place kicker Brian Franco used his strong right leg to climax five state drives against Nebraska's vaunted defense. Franco's school record of five field goals in five attempts gave Penn State the lead on three occasions. Quarterback Todd Blackledge loaded up 
and hit swift flanker Kenny Jackson behind Cornhusker coverage for a 33-yard touchdown strike late in the first half. Before the silence had been broken, Blackledge rolled right and rifled a two-pointer to running back Joel Coles, who was all alone in the end zone. The Lions led at halftime 17 to 10. With less than 12 minutes remaining and Nebraska leading, tight end Mike McCluskey hauled in a Blackledge pass at the three. Then Coles behind Munchak, McCluskey and Mead hammered over for the score, the ninth and final lead change of the game. Fired up Lion defense would shut down Nebraska's attack through the final 17 and one half minutes, preserving a rough 30 to 24 road win and building a confidence that would be evident throughout the season. In friendly Beaver Stadium, Penn State fans saluted their Lions for the team's fine performance the previous week. The team did not disappoint them. Co-captain Chet Parlevecchio and friends flexed their blue and white muscles against the Temple Owls. 60 minutes and three turnovers later, the Lion defense had notched shutout number two. Kurt Warner picked up his third straight 100-yard rushing day, scoring two touchdowns. One on a nifty 19-yard weave through fallen owls. As Kurt would be quick to point out, the outstanding performance of senior captain Sean Farrell, who anchored the strong offensive line, was responsible for creating the running room. Farrell's total domination of his opponents was evident as the Lions controlled the line of scrimmage in the 30 to nothing victory. It was performances like this that earned Sean a consensus All-American selection in 1981. For the second straight week, the Nittany Lions were home in Happy Valley. This time, when they took the field to face Boston College, it was with a number two ranking hooked to the balloons. On Penn State's first possession, the Lions drove 79 yards and Warner scored the start of another 100-yard afternoon. Running mate Mike Mead had his biggest day as a Nittany Lion. The fullback from Dover, Delaware, came into his own, rushing for 107 yards and one touchdown. Blackledge had his best day yet, throwing for nearly 200 yards and one score. Kenny Jackson hauled in the bomb, a scene to be duplicated a record tying six times in 1981. While the Penn State defense did not log shutout number three, they grounded the Eagles and forced seven turnovers, among them a Paul Langford interception. By the time quarterback Frank Rocco pitched to sophomore Jonathan Williams for a 36-yard touchdown jaunt, the fans and Todd Blackledge's thoughts were no longer on the 38-7 victory over Boston College, but on the upcoming trip to Syracuse, New York. Uh, we were very excited about playing indoors in the, in the Carrier Dome, which was a nice facility, and uh, we came out ready to play. We executed very well on offense. Kurt had his best day ever as a runner. Our line just did a super job all around. It was just one of those days where I felt quick, I felt good, and uh, we performed like a machine out there. I like to think of uh, our team as like a machine on offense. Uh, we just keep rolling. Indeed, the offensive machine chewed up the orange men. Blackledge scored one touchdown, completed 10 of 11 passes, one thanks to a spectacular catch by Greg Garrity, and touchdown passes to tight ends Vito Cab and Mike McCluskey. The day also belonged to the 5 foot 11 inch 195 pound halfback from Wyoming, West Virginia, Kurt Warner. Four touchdowns were set up by Kurt's running and pass receiving. 
and his 256 yards rushing put him in the record books as he eclipsed Shorty Miller's 69-year-old single game rushing mark. I consider myself a team ball player. I'm going to play as a team ball player. It just happened to be that uh, I had the best day out there, but uh, you had to give a lot of thanks to a lot of people, Sean Farrell and Mike Munchak and, and all of those guys up front. Uh, you had to give a lot of credit to those guys because they did a great job. Warner's performance on October 17th put the Penn State record at 5-0, put the Lions on top in the national rankings, and carved out a special spot for number 25 among the likes of number 24, Lenny Moore, number 23, Lydell Mitchell, and number 22, John Cappelletti. A football Saturday at Penn State. Alumni, fans, students, everybody out for a guaranteed good time. Flash a little of America's old pioneering spirit. Tailgating at the world's largest block party. Oh, boy! <laughs> Happy birthday to you! Today's visiting victim, West Virginia, will have little doubt where they are. After a scoreless first quarter, the faithful are more than ready for action. Tailback John Williams obliges. Wisniewski and Ed Pritz led the Big Blue defense. Rich D'Amico's sack keeps the crowd alive as shouts of We Want the Lion fill the stadium. The fans get a bonus. We want God! We want God! We want God! Todd Blackledge rifles a pass through a Mountaineer defender and Kenny Jackson is waiting. As the beat goes on, the same Mr. Jackson flies on the flanker reverse, almost reaching pay dirt. Wants six, so Mike Mead catapults into the end zone. Penn State defeats West Virginia for the 23rd consecutive time. Final score 30 to 7. In a continuation of a growing rivalry with another independent, Miami University, Penn State journeyed into hurricane territory. It was not a treat for the Lions this Halloween as Kurt Warner was injured again in the second quarter and was not able to return to action. Coach Paterno saw his Lions fall behind 17 to nothing with three quarters gone. Just as it seemed to be the darkest, Walker Lee Ashley corralled Miami's Jim Kelly killing one drive and breathing life into another. Blackledge directed a drive that featured three pass receptions by Greg Garrity for a total of 54 yards, and Mike McCluskey's catch and battle over the goal line brought the Lions within striking distance. A minute later, safety Mark Robinson delivers one of his patented hits, and the football squirts into the arms of the alert Paul Lankford. From the Miami 26, it took just one play to score. 
Blackledge to John Williams on the screen pass, and Penn State had scored two touchdowns within two minutes of each other. With momentum swinging to the Lions, State up for the two-point conversion. Blackledge completes to Jackson as the sophomore slides for the reception. Penn State threatened again with two and one half minutes remaining as Williams came up with a diving grab at the 25. But the final Halloween trick was the clock. The Lions came up short and dropped a decision to the Hurricanes. Regrouping after the Miami loss could have been easier than having to play another game on the road against North Carolina State in Raleigh. The Wolfpack, trying to break 500 for the season, came to play. The well-coached Lions went back to the basics for the move back to the win column. Penn State's solid defense held firm, knowing something big would happen. Something big did happen, and more than once. It started with a punt return by Kevin Bow, ending up deep in Wolfpack territory. Fullback Tom Barr made important straight ahead yardage. And Todd Blackledge scrambled just enough to find Greg Garrity crossing deep in the end zone. For Greg, it was his first 1981 touchdown. North Carolina State, still looking for the upset, scored on a field goal to take an early third quarter lead. On a fourth down punting situation, the specialty team did it again, thanks to two heroes. Ken Kelly lobbed a pass to Harry Hamilton, and the fleet Hamilton raced 51 yards for the score. There were two block punts. One, a Dan Biondi block, Joe Krause recovery, setting up Mike Mead's plunge for the touchdown. The Nittany Lions were back in the win column with a 22 to 15 come from behind win over Nemesis North Carolina State. Joe Paterno and Paul Bear Bryant, two of America's premier college football coaches, put their teams on display before a record-setting 85,133 fans in Beaver Stadium. As expected, both teams did some hitting. Quarterback Walter Lewis avoided the sack often enough to pass his team to a 24-3 halftime lead. The Nittany Lions got it going in the second half thanks to some hard running by John Williams. Frank Rocco to Tim Robinson touchdown pass was not enough, and Penn State's record went to seven and two. Next, a game fans had been waiting for for many, many years. The Fighting Irish of Notre Dame came to town for a meeting between college football's top independents. Nittany Lions were eager to get back on the winning track, and Harry Hamilton got it started right with a 50-yard kickoff return. Tailback John Williams had an outstanding afternoon, gaining a career high 192 yards. Williams, the workhorse of the first drive, scored as Sean Farrell, Mike Munchak, Bill Contz, and Jim Romano cleared the way.
punter Ralph Giacomaro's special team buddies came up with another big play, creating an Irish fumble that put the Lion defense back on the sidelines and gave the offense another shot at the end zone. Todd Blackledge called his own number, and it was the right one. Penn State padded its early lead. Notre Dame came right back as quarterback Blair Keel threw for two touchdowns, and the Irish took the lead. Just as it had done all year long, the blue and white defense bent, but never broke. In the shadow of the goalpost, Chet Parlavecchio and Paul Langford stopped Greg Bell's advance, and defensive tackle Greg Gattuso's interception set in motion the winning Penn State drive. The last drive, we hit a big pass to Greg Garrity across the middle that got the drive going, and then John Williams put together about three runs back-to-back -back, uh, that took us down in close. And Kurt Warner only ran the ball two times that day, but one of the runs that he made was on the four-yard line that took us down to inside the one. And after that, I took it over from the one with just some great blocking up front. I think it was just a sign of our character as a team, that last drive, because we really sucked it up and put it together and, uh, you know, went ahead and did the job. Penn State had done the expected, rebounded strongly after disappointment. Notre Dame was a great victory for us, not only as far as a team effort, but uh, it was the seniors' last effort in Beaver Stadium, and we felt we wanted to go out on top and leave a fine remembrance of a great football team in Beaver Stadium. But we were uh, quick to realize that the next week, two great football teams were to, to take uh, the field in a traditional rivalry, and the intensity level for that game is far above any other game, and we felt that the pride of Pennsylvania was on the line, and we knew we had to be ready to play a great football team, and we were ready. were set to deal with the nation's number one team, the Pitt Panthers in Pittsburgh. Pitt quarterback Dan Marino led the Panthers to an early 14 to nothing lead. When we were down 14 nothing, I remember being out on the field and, and it wasn't just let's just keep going the way we are. I think it was a matter of everybody just putting it in their heads that, hey, that's it, you know, we, we got to tighten up and, and no more for Pitt. And, and that's exactly what we did. On the first play of the second quarter, Reno went after his third touchdown. Roger Jackson's unbelievable diving interception was the result. Jackson's theft was to change the game around. Blackledge, with the safety blitz upon him, completed to Mike Mulkowski. Fullback Mike Mead rammed over, and Lion fans had something to cheer about. Reno's attempt to rally Pitt again met with staunch resistance at the goal line from Roger Jackson, whose gentle bump left the ball up for grabs. Mark Robinson's alert recovery had everything headed in the other direction. Todd Blackledge seized control and continued to put together the best game of his career. With time running out in the first half, Blackledge scored on an eight-yard quarterback draw, tying the game at 14. Pitt's offense had fallen on hard times. Penn State's defensive surge continued into the second half, forcing turnovers, giving the offense fine field position. Blackledge hit Kenny Jackson in full stride from the 42. Jackson pirouetted on the sideline and streaked in for the score. Less than three minutes later, the Blackledge-Jackson connection struck again, this time from 45 yards out. The Nittany Lion offensive machine was at its best, accounting for 42 points and a 434-yard total offense, putting the Panthers in a state of shock. Working on a shutout since the first quarter, linebacker Matt Bradley climaxed a great season-long performance with an important interception. Robinson added the coup de gras. When Marino dropped back to pass, 
uh, read him, he, he looked right at his receiver, and, you know, I, and I knew that I was the one covering him. And when he threw the ball, I just stepped in front of him, and that began it right there. I ran downfield and uh, broke, you know, broke one tackle, and more or less started to turn on the burners if I could. And then I approached another tackler, and he he tried to tackle me and took my shoe off, and I ended up running about 65 more yards without a shoe. It was a 91-yard interception return for Penn State's final touchdown. It was an extremely rewarding victory for the Nittany Lions and certainly established Penn State as one of the great college football teams of 1981. The postseason reward came in the form of an invitation to defend their Fiesta Bowl crown against the Trojans of Southern California. Nittany Lion followers happily made the adjustment to the warm Tempe, Arizona climate and equally warm hospitality. On the game's first scrimmage play, Penn State defensive tackle Dave Ofar forced a Marcus Allen fumble. The ever-present Roger Jackson recovered. For the second year in a row, Kurt Warner scored on his first Fiesta Bowl carry. Penn State would never be headed as the Lions flip into the new calendar year with a 26-10 Fiesta Bowl victory. The January 1st encounter gave Penn State's defense one last challenge. Stop Marcus Allen, the Heisman Trophy winner. Just as they had done all year, seniors Leo Wisniewski, Chet Parlevecchio, Matt Bradley, Ed Pritz, Rich D'Amico, and Paul Langford led the blue and white defensive wrecking crew. On offense, quarterback Todd Blackledge set up behind Sean Farrell and his experienced partners on the offensive line and had another fine passing day. The development of Blackledge, the Fiesta Bowl MVP performance of Kurt Warner, and the skills of all the returning underclassmen mean next fall will again provide Penn State fans with that something special found on all Nittany Lion teams. The 1981 Penn State football team was something special. They worked awfully hard. They had great leadership. They did everything a coach could ask of a football team. And at the end of the year, I really believe they were as fine a football team as there was in the country. They did everything that anybody could be asked to do and did it very well. And I'm very, very proud of them. They've also left us with a great legacy. And we're hopeful that the 1982 team can pick up where the 1981 team left off. It's going to be tough. Got a tough schedule. We're going to have to replace some really good leaders. Paolo Vecchio and Wisniewski and Frau were three of the strongest leaders we've ever had. But I think we have the young people who can do it, and I think it's going to be a very exciting year. But no matter what 82 brings to us, we're never going to forget what these kids did in 81. They were a superb football team, and they set a standard that I think that we're going to have to work awfully hard to measure up to. State football, 1981, the year great expectations were matched only by giant achievements for the glory of Penn State.